evening participants welcome back to lecture number 11 of this uh, lecture series of 15 days on history of english literature tomorrow uh, today we have among us uh, dr ivan yong yi wong uh, and she will be deliberating on uh, the modernism and the literature of the first world war on behalf of uh, team dad Wei general i welcome i extend my uh, welcome hearty welcome to dr ivan and i also take the opportunity to introduce dr ivan to all of you dr ivan holds a phd in english literature from durham university uk and she has published widely on dorothy richardson popular culture and her works have appeared on hong kong review of books she has taught literature in the UK and in Hong Kong and is currently teaching at College of International Education, Hong Kong Baptist University. Her research interests include modernism, phenomenology, women writers, space and place in literature and inter-art studies. On behalf of Inda Voyage, we are very happy, honored and thankful for taking this opportunity and the challenge of delivering a lecture to a heterogeneous group without wasting much time. The platform is all yours, Dr. Ivan, and thank you and welcome once again. Thank you so much. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Benerji, for such a kind introduction. And before I start, I just want to make sure that can everyone hear me because sometimes the network seems to be not very friendly. But can you all hear me all right? Hopefully, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, we can all hear you. And I, I would ask the participants, uh, I think they can hear you. You can write in the chat box, the participants. Yes, they can hear you. Of understanding of what modernism is and uh, its relationship with uh, uh, fermentation and fragments and something about First World War. And then um, this is how I want to start. When all that is solid melts into air, and when things fall apart, the center cannot hold. What we have in front of us, what is the kind of world that we see? What do you see in front of you? Fragments, as T.S. Eliot said, these fragments I've shored against my rooms, one of the most important, famous or infamous lines of modern literature from the wasteland, which we will be talking about a little bit today. Fragments, fragmentation, modernism. And aesthetics of fragmentation, encountering early modernism and the literature of First World War will be the topic or the topics of my talk today. And before I really start, um, I need to have two cautionary notes or two disclaimers. And the first one is fragmentation. Now, we all know that modernism is notoriously hard to define, to study, to look at. And then fermentation is simply one way through which we can look at this complicated and um, far reaching, impactful artistic movement. So I think the expert audience here would surely have your take on that. And this is the take that I'm taking today, looking at modernism as fermentation. And it's actually, I hope this would be a helpful lens through our discussion that for your understanding of modernism. Second, now early modernism. Again, it's very difficult to set a periodic line about uh, when it's early, when it's more uh, late, when it's in the middle. So um, I will take liberty because we have the next lecture on late modernism. So I will limit my um, discussion to the works produced or published before 1930. And you will see why in, my, in, my, in this coming slide. Oh, okay. Um, before that, we're going to have the flow of the lecture defined a little bit. First, I'm going to give you some definitions because I've just said fermentation, modernism, they are big terms. And I think that a little bit of definitions will um, would, set, would help to set up kind of framework for our discussion today. So a bit of definition. And then context. So what was the material um, social political situation that gave rise to this very hard to understand artistic movement? If this movement is very hard to understand, was it because it came out from a very difficult period of human history as well? So context. 
Number three, the beef of the talk and aesthetics of fermentation. Writing the fragments. I thought about whether I should put the the here. If I put the the here, it, it might refer simply to more than its fragments, but are we living in such a unified, happily united world? Well, we all live in our in the kind of fragments, but then I'll just have the bracket there. So it could be more than fragments, but it could be alive today as well. Writing fragmentarily, yes. And then I'm talking about the uh, form and the technique. Writing the fragments could be the subject matter. And that would be some of the approach that I would take for today's lecture. And then the fourth part, yes, war literature. I think it's not fair to talk about monism without mentioning First World War, because First World War, as we know it, fragmented our history and at the turn of the century. And then I will, concluding, I will be concluding a lecture with a very fragmentary short notes. All right, so um, without further, further um, ado, let's get to the content. First, the general definition of modernism. Now, um, it's a kind of like art movement all across the arts, approximately between 1870 to 1950. Then you might know the reason why I had the line cut at 1930, because um, that will be the period of early and high mm. modernism. And after that would be late modernism. I'm sure um, they will be handled by more able hands out there. And then um, Peter Child, a uh, acclaimed critic on modernism, he once defined very succinctly what modernism is. Now look at the highlights. Um, it refers to the efforts of many individuals across the arts, right? It's a movement across the arts in all the arts who try to move away from the established modes of representation. Now, that sounds a bit vague, uh, open. What do you mean by that? Now, let's consider this painting. I'm sure many of you will actually know the title of this painting. Now, if, if you know, hold it to yourself. Let's explore it together with two to three questions. First, what's happening in this painting? What is the subject? What do you see there? And the second, oh, this is a string of questions, but the second important question is, can you try to guess the title of this painting? Now, you have to start from the basic. What do you see on this piece of painting? Now, you see some a musical score. You see a ball, okay, that used to play violin, right? So you might be something about music. And then here, uh, this, what does it look like? This is like a, um, like a robot or a human face. So two eyes, one mouth, two eyes, one mouth, one eye, but that might or might not be a human face, right? So we, we could conclude kind of uh, with these three human beings, they who play music. So maybe three musicians playing perhaps violin or cello, right? So we can see the ball and perhaps a little bit of um, fragments of violins. And this is the title of this painting is Three Musicians or Three um, Violinists by Pablo Picasso. You say, what? This is the representation of human face. Yes. And this is how we represent a violin or playing violin. Yes. Now, this is what do we mean by moving away from established modes of representation. The reality doesn't seem real anymore. It's not the world that we can recognize. It's not made according to the established modes of representation. And when in painting, it, Picasso produced something like that. How about in literature? That we might be producing, or writers couldn't have like produced, or they did produce literatures that are not that recognizable, that pulled away from established modes of representation. The writers, they reconsidered or they reused or remake or remix, okay, the fundamentals of literature. Well, we might still have a bit of theme, we can still have a bit of, of character, but they're all done in a way that has moved away from established modes, right? So this is a very general definition of modernism by Peter Childs. And then, so modernism done, how about fermentation? We'll get there, but let's talk a bit more on moving away. Modernism is moving away from the established. So 
I have given you here a list of critics, very, some very famous, some not that famous, but it seems that they all point to a consensus about modernism and fermentation, right? So um, Robert Reed, modernism is break up the solution. Modernism is about fermentation. This is a famous one, right? Uh, fermentation, discontinuity. It's a fault line, Jameson, we all know him. It's a strategic fault line. Now, this is what we mean by dissolution, really dissolving into thin air. Strategic fault line pooling away like mountains, sides pooling away or being pulled away. Peter Faulkner is a rupture. So they're breaking away, they're fermenting, they are disluting, they are disintegrating, breaking up from what? They're breaking up from 19th century assumptions and practices. And this is actually also one of the, one of the views held by the other famous critic, Michael Levinson, but not to the same degree. So it seems that they have uh, reached a kind of critical consensus, which is rare in literature, about something very fragmentary. So modernism is moving away, is fragmentation and fragments, as we can see here. Right, so modernism, check, moving away, check, fragments, not really check. So what is then fragments? Now, let's go back a little bit. We roll the hands of time teleologically to the time of ancient Greek and Latin, because fragments is a word that had a very ancient root from ancient Greece. In Greek, fragments, the act of moving away, pulling away, had the root as the spasm. Now, what is a spasm? Now, I'm terrible in science to explain that, but perhaps you can try to understand that through this little picture to try to show you here. You can understand as like I've pulled my ankle or I have sprained my ankle. So it's like a very sudden, unpleasant rupture, okay, a pull of muscle, okay, that could be quite painful as you can see the little animal here. It's not very comfortable. You pull this, you pull your ankle, you sprain your ankle. It's rather painful. And these kind of physical descriptions, this kind of physical uh, uh, situations yeah. are what the word spasm, okay, are related with. And from the critic I quote from here, he or she has given a list of words about spasm. And then, of course, I'm not going to read through them all, but when reading through this, this list of words, I've come up with two categories, actually. They can be roughly chopped up, okay, irresponsibly, into two categories. One is pulling away, the other is pulling together. Pulling away, pulling together, me, contradictory, right? So for the meaning of fragments, predominant, predominantly it seems that the word means pulling away. You see words as tearing away, surveying, drawing sideways, sprain, pull, pull the ankle, spasm, drawing secretly away. So in other words, it's just like a, a kind of centrifugal force that's pulling things away. But at the same time, we have words of pulling together embrace, greeting, you're trying to get someone or something closer. And then the other word is whirling around. Now, we're not going to throw everything away, but we can keep it there in a kind of like psychical pattern, pattern. So if modernism is fermentation and fermentation means pulling away and pulling, um, pulling away and pulling together, then we see something very unique about modernism in the sense that it, is the, it embodies a pair of um, contradictory tension. On the first side is pulling away, but then at the same time we have pulling together. So it is dual presence of paradoxical forces. So on the one hand, we have some of the tradition, but the other hand, we are trying desperately to pull away. So this is what makes modernism very difficult. In a way, we cannot recognize it, but sometimes we can recognize it. So what the heck is that? And this is why modernism is notoriously difficult to learn and to teach. And thank you for coming here then. 
Okay, so this is dual complicated nature of modernism as constituting two forces pulling away and pulling together. And as just mentioned, because of the force of pulling away, we want to break away, but we're still wanting to keep some. So modernism always has, the modern writers always have issues with the tradition, the literary tradition, the canon. In the 19th century, the, the, what came before them. Now, Vincent Sherry, in, in, in his war writing, he said, negotiate, uh, uh, modernism is negotiating the significance of the old. So what are we going, what are we doing with this old? The old world is crumbling. What should we keep? How should we keep? How should I make use of that? Negotiate the significance of the old. Harold Rosenberg, a famous one, he said, the modernists, they are making the tradition of the new. Now, again, paradoxical, when we establish a kind of pattern, a way of doing things, we are forming a tradition. But this is tradition of the old, or of, of, of the new, by remaking the old, because the old world is crumbling, we are remaking what's being undone. That's Vincent Sherry's word. So I don't have to look far just to give you this, guys. Ulysses, people. Ulysses, the most important work of, um, of James Joyce. The presence of the old you can, is clearly felt. It has elements or structure like um, Homer's Odysseus. The chapter titles, they were all mythical um, characters. And not to mention Elias Wasteland, the presence of all kinds of allusions, obvious or not. Now, these two poet or writers, they have kept critics very busy, still very busy today, cracking their Asian code, right? So we are going to briefly touch on Eliot and Joyce today, but later. So um, after discussing the issues modernism has with tradition, we see further or more clearly the dynamics between the old and the new that characterize modernism and modernist fragments of fermentation is pulling away and pulling together. All right, so uh, having said all that, I think we would have the question about, so why this difficult, this difficult to understand kind of um, literature um, came up at that period of time. What gave birth to this kind of literature or to this fermentation? It's because it was the period we call modernity. Modernity gave birth to modernism. And how do we define modernity? Now, of course, I have all this definition up here, but very quickly, I just want to understand modernity is a, is a time of changes and of crises. Now, let's simply look at a question here, uh, the, the, the pictures here. We see factory workers working in a factory, in a way like a chicken, uh, in, in, like a chicken farm, in a way. Everyone not smiling, working like a robot. Produce more, earn more. They're being, they're just the screws being driven, right? For higher goals or for money. And when we have factory workers, we have factories in the city. We now have modern cities. It's not that Victorians they didn't have cities, but we have a very different form of city during the turn of the century. It's a train station, I think. So we have counters, we have restaurants, a kind of like Union Station in, in, in the US. It's a, a city very much modernized with modern modes of transport. We've got trains, we've got trams, we've got bus. And that was the time that we started like air travel, right? Before the bombing air rates of first for one, at the same time, we still, we also have air travels. So everything got speeded up. Everything got more convenient. And this is also a time marked by progress in science. So, when we're so confident in our ability to invent, to discover, to produce something like this. Now, a Google told me this is a piece of weapon. I don't know what that is. But this is the time of modernity. This is a time of a way of experiencing life and living in a very new way. And it's brought about or characterized by industrialization, urbanization, and secularization. 
Now, secularization means um, religion no longer had the supreme power in overruling people's lives. Now, G.B. Shaw had a very um, cunning but funny quote. He once said, why we should ask the Pope on the advice on sex? Now, not a very respectful quote to the Pope, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm pardoned if, I offend, if that offended anyone, but that shows secularization during modernity. Religious religion no longer holds the center position in one's lives. So it's our ordinary people deciding our own life. And also marked by the rise of capitalism, social studies, deregulation, yes, society becomes more prosperous, people become more powerful, technology becomes more powerful, then government, okay, have to be very busy controlling, administrating all that. So mass systems of industry, institutionalization, administration and surveillance. All right, so I think later speakers will be talking about Foucault and surveillance and so on. So I think to me here, yeah, four words characterizes, uh, characterize modernity, progress, productivity, prosperity, and prowess. I think they are in logical order. We have progress and we can produce more. We can produce more, we become richer. And when we become richer, we make ourselves more powerful and produce something like this. But then all of this will lead to problems. When things got to their saturation point, they will create problems. And what goes up must come down. When these um, four words reach their fullest capacity, problems, consequences would arise. And the problems were dehumanization. Just look at these robots. Do they feel like human beings? No, they're simply robots working. They are, and then they can't look after themselves well. How about their families, their friends, their interpersonal relationships? They all fell apart. We all, in, we all lived in cities. We have alienated ourselves from nature, our mother nature. So the bonds, the connections, the interrelations, they all fell down. And it's not happening only on individual level, but also on national and international level. When alienation intensified, we are no, no longer connected. So what? Every one of us became, becomes a piece of fragment, fragmentation. And when countries believe in these four Ps, they are less likely to settle problems in a sort of means. They will resort to those. And then what happens? Boom, First World War, right? So maternity is a period of drastic change. And change brings about challenge. And we, when we could no longer handle those challenges, we have crises. Julian Hanna said, the term crisis is often, often used to describe an aspect of modernism. Literature of crisis, of value, of knowledge, of belief. I start with knowledge. Knowledge is what we know about the world, and that is in crisis. Belief and value, what we think about ourselves, what we think about the world, what's happening inside of us. They are crumbling down as well. So in a world that's fragmented, in a world that's crumbling down, can we still use the old language to describe a world that's no, no longer the same? Then we, come, we came to the language of a crisis of language that marks modernism. So a new form of language or literary representation was needed to represent a world that has gone fermented. So modern, uh, modernity, modernism, they all mark a critical point in literature. All right, so this is the context that gave birth to um, modernism, modernity, and the problems, consequences of modernity. So a very short summary here, modernism and fermentation, what, what, what are, how shall I describe their relationships? Now, to me, they are in a kind of very interactive dynamic bond. Um, to me, they are like impetus and driving force that engender, fuel and shape one another. One cannot live without the other. One drives the other, one shapes the other. And they are also the manifestation and the epitomes of one another. They reflect, reflect and, and embody one another. So, surface, beneath the surface, beneath the surface and the surface, they are just interacting, they produce one another. This is how I understand their um, connections and interactions, okay? So uh, 
after the con uh, definitions and the context, so we've gone quite a long way from the meaning of modernism to um, meaning of fragments, and then the context that gives birth to more modern uh, modernism, modernity, and how do fragmentation and modernism connect? Right. So then I think we are in a hopefully um, okay position to look at the works of feminism, uh, of modernism and aesthetics of fermentation, writing the fragments, the subject matter of modernism, and writing fermentarily the techniques and the form. Now, this is the first textual example I want to show you. Um, of course, I won't have the time to read through that, but I want, we, we, I want us to look at the highlights together. Right, so step by step. So starting here, some of you might have recognized where does it from when you see the word Marlowe. All right, bear with me. So we have I, we have our, right? First person narration. So I uh, is somewhere, okay? And Marlowe is near the I. And then what is the I doing here, listening to Marlowe? And what is Marlowe is going to tell us Okay, so he has been to the dark places of the earth. We know the novel we know is Congo he's talking about. All right, so relatively simple. And then here we see silence, we see darkness, we see light, silence and pause. In terms of pause, we see um, dashes, oh, actually ellipses as well. All right, so these are the few things I just want to I want you to pay I want you to pay attention to. First person narration, listening to Marlowe, and we know the presence of darkness and light and silence. Mm. Second page is not done yet. Okay, so we are now firmly um, rooted in the fact that I sit here to hear one of Marlowe's inclusive experience. So at this time, you might have the idea, right? Okay, I sit here to hear about Marlowe's journey, inclusive experience. But Conrad here pulled us from the certainty of, okay, we're going to listen to Marlowe's story, no. Marlowe said, I don't want you to um, listen too much to what's happening to me, and I'm not going to tell you that. The gist of my story is that I want to tell something about the poor chap, Kurtz. Okay, so again, I sit here wanting to listen to Marlowe. Marlowe said, mm, don't, don't, don't listen to me counting, recounting my story. I want to tell you about Kurtz. So it's retelling of the eye of Marlowe, of Kurtz, the layers of narratives that made learners of Call of Darkness um, feeling very troubled at, at the beginning, right? So what about that journey to the darker place of the earth? Now, it's like a quest, right? Marlow goes to Congo, the dark heart, the heart of darkness, should be something very exciting, anything but ordinary. But he said it's not extraordinary, it's something rather simple, rather ordinary, not very unusual. How could that be? And then to further pulling you from the excitement of that quest, he said, and they're not very clear now either. And how could that be? Such a brave, courageous quest to the heart of Africa should be anything but unclear, should be very impressive, should be very eventful, but no, not very clear. And then you, again, you are feeling very un uncertain. So am I going to trust um, Marlowe's recounts when he wasn't very clear about what's happening and it's not very exciting. But then when you're losing interest, Marlowe say, well, yet yeah, it seems to show a kind of light. What kind of light? Right? So this is from Joseph Conrad, Heart of, Heart of Darkness. These are my, my, my emphasis. Okay, so this is that one. Now I'm going to show you another set. Right. You will recognize, yes, that's Cantos from Ezra Pound. Now, in a way, I'm very lucky because I'm Chinese. I could read these words. I know what they mean. But then a Pound, when he was writing these poems, he said, I actually did not know what were the meanings of these 
Chinese words. And then you'll be saying, what the heck? How could that happen? How could a poet not totally understanding what he's writing, not understanding the meaning of those words that he's putting into his poems? Weird, right? And then we have something even more strange coming up. Now, these are recognizable um, language still in use. How about these? Egyptians hieroglyphics. Could you read that? I doubt if Pound could read them himself. Again, putting into his poetry languages and figures that he do not know very clear. And then this one that's even more intriguing. How would you describe that? Graphs? Computational graphs, mathematical models? Not words. And then here, if I enlarge the picture, oh yeah, if I enlarge the picture, you'll actually see this Asian Greek word, and they are measurements, fraction, measurements and fractions. If he's putting everything into his everything like this into his poems, are these two poems? What do they mean? Can I have a way of figuring out what who are they trying to say? That may be why the guide and annotated first uh, edition to Pound's cantos is longer than the poems themselves. And then you could see the reason why. Okay, this one, finally say, yes, I recognize every word here, but do you know their meaning? And this is what happens with poetry, and especially with modernist poetry. So in the station of the metro, it's like a train in metro station. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. So ghostly faces, ghostly of these faces. Uh, you are thinking maybe the, 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 the commuters or the travelers in the crowd. And then you see a semicolon. Now, grammatical expectation. When you see a semicolon, you are going to expect. So the later sentence is going to explain what happens before, right? But then do you see any ex explanations? Petals on a wet black cough, a boss. So what's happening here? Ghostly faces, petals on wet black boss. Do they logically explain one another? How can the ghostly faces of those human faces, petals on wet black boss? Now, linguistically, they don't seem very much connected. And then you see those blanks. What do you mean? What, do, what does it mean by those blanks? But then if you try to visualize what's been described here, so this ghostly faces in the crowd, yes, misty, gray, dirty, metro station, and then these faces, not spirited, pale faces, quite ghastly, in fact. And then you try to associate this image with the petals on a wet black cloth, also in a horrible weather. Ah, then they seem to make sense. You do not under, um, try to understand these poems in terms of the words, but through the pictures composed by these words. These words, to be more precise, are the descriptions of an image. So this piece of poem, so we call an images poem, is there to evoke a visual image. And through that visual um, provocation or, or evocation, you get a sense, the atmosphere and then the feeling. But then it's just still poetry. The reasons why I'm showing you this, okay, from the good old Conrad, I'm not going to tell you clearly what happened. Yeah, just try to guess what do we mean by that. I actually tried to show you these features, define literary fragments. Now, from these two critics, we can see quite clearly these um, features are the features of literary fragments. The emergence of verse libra from formal verses, that means free verse. Yes, well, I think it's more than free verse when we see the fractions, the diagrams of um, Pound's poem. You, can, you can't see many rhymes, no meter, no rhyme. It's really pulling away from the older tradition is the emergency, uh, emergence of free verse. The subversion of linear plot, yes. What I listen to on that dock or on that ship is actually Marlowe's recount of his journey. And his journey is not the, the, 
main focus. The main focus is about Kurtz as we know it, right? So this is just a version of a linear plot. Translation quotations, we've, we've seen that in, in, um, in pounds, right? So fragmentation is kind of liberation, pooling, liberating freedom from the old with converging antinomies, right? So we've got the polar opposites. They're, put, they're pulling together light and darkness, in hall of darkness. We've got light, we've got darkness. They're not so far away from one another. Openability. Now, can you be rather sure about the meaning of um, Pound's poem? Can you rather be sure about what exactly happened in Marlowe's journey? No, the meaning interpretation are so open, openability. Structure dichotomy, yes, light and darkness in heart of darkness. Suppression of signifiers and absence of the signifier. Now, to put it very simply, suppression of signifiers. Signifiers take them as words or signs and represent something. In this case, words, right? We, use, we want to use words to convey a meaning, to signify a meaning. But from Pang's poem, can we really be sure about the meaning of the words and the meaning that these words wants to convey? It's all destabilized, isn't it? Longlinearity, yes, we see that in the longlinear linear plot. Deconstructing the binary. Binary are the two ends of a spectrum. And in half of darkness, we have darkness, we have light, but we are doing away this binary with presence of flicker. What is a flicker? Flicker is a very dim form of light or a very unstable form of light. It could be quite dark, it could be quite bright. Flicker, it's not only darkness, but light. We're doing away this binary, deconstructing. The eloquence of silence, yes, pause, silence, ellipsis dashes, pauses, not saying anything. It seems that nothing's happening, but really, is there nothing happening? Well, open to your interpretation there. Complexity, yes, the, num the multiple narr narrative the frames of Hall of Darkness. Okay, I think we were all scratching our heads once when trying to read that novel, right? Complexity of the narrative layers, subversion and the paradigm. You're having a conquest to Congo, this is a very um, orthodox kind of quest narrative. You're having a grand journey to descend to, to the Hall of Darkness, but then it's not eventful. There's nothing extraordinary. Should be very impressive, but actually I can't remember much. So it's a subversion of a genre of a paradigm. Episodicity, yes. And um, Hall of Darkness as, as we know it is a novella. So it's, a short, it's longer than a short story, but shorter than a formal fiction. And it's written in three episodes. So epi ep episodicity. Yeah. Here we can see these two canonical modernist works from the features we just talked about. They are demonstrating, or they are in fact, literary fragments. And these two works are the two kind of like representative um, modernist work uh, with Conrad's one came a bit earlier, just before the turn of the century and uh, pound in 1910 and 1920-ish. But they are already demonstrating the representative works of those period, demonstrating many features of literary fragments or from literary film fragmentation. And this definition of literary fragments of fragmentation has a lot of parallel with literary modernism. Now, how Malcolm Bradbury once defined a tree modernism Ex experiment. I'm sure this is a quote you know well. This experimental, formally complex, elliptical, contains elements of decreation as well as creation. And then it's freedom from realism, materialism, traditional genre and form. Now, if we have a kind of like mathematical match between Bradbury's definition here, and also what we have just seen from these two critics definition of literary fragments, we can see lots of overlaps. So in a way it's proof that literary modernism is really about fragments or fragmentation, experimental emergency of free verse, long linearity, a new way of writing, form, formally complex, okay, in terms of, of episodicity, in terms of the narrative frames, 
elliptical, the eloquence of silence and dash. We are leaving something out elliptical where I'm not saying that very directly, it's in dash, in pause, in silence. Decreation um, as well as creation. Now, this might be a little bit hard to understand, but I could explain that through suppression of signifiers and the absence of, of signified. We no longer trust the function of words to convey meaning. That's why Pound was having lots of symbols, lots of foreign languages, because in a way, he was casting out of this belief of doubt to the function of language as the conveyor of meaning. But then when you are writing this poem, a piece of poem, you want to create a word of art, you want to create some meaning, but you're using a way that's undermining what you want to do. So it's decreating. So decreation as well as creation. And then freedom from the old ideologies, literary linguistic uh, prescriptions, yes. Realism, well, realism, materialism, we need to have something very real, solid, right in front of us, the world as it is, details, facts, all to the point. But friend Conrad, can we really be sure about the factuality, about the world as it is? Can we? Not really, right? Traditional form and genre, yes. Ezra Pound's poem. Can we still call that poems or description or verbal visual description? Pound's cantos, are they still poems? Any forms you can ascribe them to? Not really, right? So from this very quick um, comparison, you can see literary modernism and fermentation, they are in a way quite similar. All right, and then uh, there are some other modernist fragments that I want to, uh, I need to introduce. I, I don't think I can leave the scene without mentioning this. Now, James Joyce, Ulysses, another kind of modernist fragments. Again, I'm not going to uh, read the whole thing, but again, read through, read through the highlights. Mr. Liberal Bloom, yes, is having his breakfast. And what is he having for breakfast? Inner organs of feast and fowls, chocolate soup, da da da. Now, this is a off the chart, cholesterol rich breakfast, right? And it's so off the chart that it smells faintly scented urine. Not very decent, not very classy. And what's so special about um, Ulysses is the first piece of literary works that mentions. Okay, female menstruation. Yes, James Joyce was the first one to do that. Nothing so grand, even something unpleasant there. So back to our kitchen scene. So uh, Bloom is in the kitchen, readying the, the breakfast, uh, putting all the food on the plate and plate on the tray. Outside the window, it's a gentle summer morning in Dublin. And then the coals were reddening He's slicing um, that uh, bread and butter, making a good cuppa kettles on. And then as to this very still morning scene, a cat with tail on high. Meow. Right? What do we see here? Yeah. We don't see kings and queens, and monarchs and nobles, popes fighting for justice, struggling for power, scrambling for more lands. We don't see that. What do we see? We see what you have every day. Getting breakfast ready, getting the cuppa ready, and then you are good to start the day. This is what we see. This is what we do. This is what do we mean by the ordinary, the, ev the every day. Actually, nothing much really happens, as we can see here. All right, so the other modernist fragments that is very important to modernism is the emphasis on the ordinary, the everyday. We don't see nobles, kings anymore. We see Bloom, a, a, a middle-aged white collar works in, who works in Dublin. And in Ulysses is a record of Dubliners, such records of three Dubliners in one day. What happens there? Nothing much happens. It records what happens every day, all the time. 
Gertrude Stein says, stories, narratives, concerns itself with what's happening every day, all the time. And what's happening all the time, everyday life, your breakfast or lunch or dinner, right? The smell of your food, the smell of your cat. It's simply ordinary or occurrences that makes up something like this, people. Right, the whole book of Ulysses. So it's ordinary occurrences that are being put into the center of modern literature. And this is another ordinary uh, 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 modern fragments I think I, I need to mention. And this tra tradition started with impressionists in, 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 in painting. Well, but, but the painters would paint um, a flower bouquet or a scene in the cafe uh, with uh, modernist day would usually portray a day in London, a day in Dublin, the fleeting moments, the fleeting fragments, the ordinary fragments of mundane modern life in different regards. So this is um, the modernist ordinary fragments. And then um, the other modernist fragments that I cannot leave without, like I, can, I cannot leave uh, without referencing is um, something like this. Okay, so Mrs. Dalloway, we all know that very well. And then uh, this quote, we have, I have you see four colors here. And then in this very short block of text, about 12 lines, I've divided them into four um, colors. Why? Because in this short four um, colors, four things or four thoughts, have fallen into or fallen upon the mind of Clarissa. The first, having lived in London for how many years? So the first thought she is recording here is, so how many years have I lived here? Nightly walk in London or walking at night, the traffic. Number three, a pause. Suddenly we have a pause. But it's a pause about, um, influ uh, it's about what's happening in front of her or it's caused by the influenza that she's suffering. And then suddenly, bam, big bang, the big bang strikes. And then she ponders on the nature of time. First a warning, then the hour lost in your life, congratulations. Right? So in this short 12 lines, four unrelated thoughts have fallen onto or upon the mind of Clarissa and the narrator, the I, or you can say Wolf, is trying to show us that. And this is what the fragments, the thoughts that go through your mind and you are rendering those um, fragments. Yes, stream of consciousness, right? So this is again to me a very more, it's very important on bondedness um, um, fragments. So what is stream of consciousness? Consciousness. I think we know this term quite quite well, right? So it's a fragment to me. It's a fragment of inner psyche that form a stream. Now let's go back to William James, the psychologist who coined this word. Consciousness does not appear as chopped up in bits. So it's not chopped up. So they are in a way connected. Yet it's nothing joined. Between the thoughts, between the influence and the big band, between how many years I've lived in London and the nightly walk, we could not see any logical or causal connection between these fragmentary thoughts, right? They just flow. They form a string and then they just flow. And these fragments constitute our consciousness. And then it flows like this. So a river or a stream are the metaphors by which we can understand consciousness and stream of consciousness. Stream, consciousness like a stream, and then we have that rendered on the page of a novel. Stream of consciousness is the attempt to render the thoughts as they fall upon the mind of character. And then um, it's not linear, as you can see, these fragmentary thoughts, they have no logical connections. It could be free associations. It could be sensory observation, repetition. 
a very good example could be, yes, you might be listening to the, to, to, to the lecture now, but what's happening or what kind of thoughts are falling upon your mind? Let me think about, hmm, I shouldn't have told my boss that this morning. Oh, I should be doing some laundries after that. Oh, I might be thinking, I might need a drink after this, right? Free as association with no causal links between the thoughts. Right. And then when we render those thoughts on the page, it's non-linear and we have very peculiar punctuation and syntax. Now, when we come to that, we can see, right, in this 12 lines, we already see two or actually three semicolons, pause, silence, two dashes. Now, these are making uh, the meaning or the interpretation of Mona's text rather difficult, right? But then it is what it is. This is the flow of our thoughts, our inner thoughts, okay? That form a stream according to William James. It's random, it's unstructured, it's chaotic. But to a modernist mind, these fragments, these thoughts, they are the purest fragments or moments of being. When it comes to the moment of being, Wolf has something to say on that, but the person who really has marked, okay, the meaning of those precious fragments is Joyce with the term epiphany. Epiphany, okay, is a sudden spiritual moment. It's a dawning moment of profound understanding and realization. Uh, like a bling, eureka moment that I, oh, I understand something. Now, maybe in this passage, it's is less clear, but if I'm allowed to stretch a bit, might be the last few lines could be the epiphany that Clarissa has or the epiphany that dawned on Clarissa at that moment. When the big band strikes, yes, it's three o'clock in, in the afternoon, out it boomed. First a warning, musical. Hmm, sounds doesn't, doesn't sound too bad. Then the hour, irrecover, irrecoverable. Oh yes, arriving of... 3 p.m. in the morning, uh, in, the, in the afternoon, and congratulations, you've, you've got one hour closer to mortality. You have lost one hour in your life, irrecoverable. This is nature of time, isn't it? Right? So it could be, if I'm allowed to stretch, it could be the kind of epiphany that um, Dalloway has at that moment. So it's the purest but significant um, realization or moments of being. Right, so this is um, all I think I want to say about the modernist novel in terms of fragmentation. We've got stream of consciousness, we've got the ordinary mundane fragments of everyday life, we've got um, the list of literary uh, fragments in parallel with literary modernism by looking at works of by Conrad and Pound. So, and with this novel section, Okay, we move on to um, poetry. Now, yes, I'm going to try to tackle this giant, T.S. Eliot, and then um, it's impossible for me to really talk about it in great detail, and I can't actually show you um, the actual passage very clearly. So um, allow me to uh, show you the text Yeah. Okay. So if you can see my share screen, this is Wasteland. What you can do is that you can Google it and then you can get to the text yourself, Poetry Foundation. Yes, that is Wasteland. All right. So um, this is the look of the poem. We know this is a long one. So it has five sections. First, the burial of the dead. Second, a game of chess. Three, fire sermon. Four, the long one, death by water, five, what the thunder said, right? So these are the five major segments that make up, or five episodes that make up the notorious wasteland. And from this picture, you will know this is really a kind of wasteland, the post-war London, okay? And then in terms of fermentation, I'm going to talk about the fragmentation of the wasteland in terms of its subject matter, its form and structure, and also the techniques. 
Now, let's start with subject matter. I've got, I've got the quotes for you here, not to worry. In terms of from fragments of subject matter, first, according to the list, we have structured dichotomy and we are deconstructing, doing away with that structured dichotomy. First one, creation and decreation. If you look at this landscape, there's no way that we, we could create something, right? It's no place for life. But at this arid wasteland, someone will try to create, try to rejuvenate, try to give chances to life. In, start, in, in uh, section one, at the very beginning, line goes like this. Feeding, creating lives, helps to create life. A little life with dried tubers. Dried tubers, not a good place to nurture life, but I'm trying to feed a little life into it. Decreation, creation. Breeding lilacs out of the dead land. That land is no place for flowers, delicate as lilacs. But then in this, this place, not for creation, I'm, I'm trying to breed something. Creation, decreation. Creation and decreation, so there's always the tension. Like the modern's fragments, they are always pulling away, but they are pulling together. Creation and decreation, it's like the eternal tension that marks the modernists and modernist fragments. Second, life and death. Again, life and death, two ends of this spectrum. But then we are doing away with this binary. I was neither living nor dead. I'm not living, I'm not dead, I'm in the middle, where am I? I'm a zombie, right? Purgatorial shadow. So this is deconstructing structured dichotomy as the first subject matter that I want to deal with, showing the feature of fragmentation of fragments in modern poetry. Second, self-irony. Now, this is actually one of the, um, um, one of the uh, points, um, Listed here, okay, um, self-irony. And then in Wasteland, we see that quite clearly. In section five, the last section of the poem, um, we see this, the, the speaker seeing these runes, heartbroken, asked a question, a very heavy one. Shall I at least set my hands in order? I might not be able to rebuild it, I may, not to, I may not be able to give it life, but as, shall I at least set my hand, set my lens in order? Can I put them into a kind of order just to sort it out before anyone can do anything about it? A question, right? But then it is written after lines talking about the falling towers of Jerusalem, of Athens, of Alexandria, of Vienna and London. And what are these places? They are the epic centers of human, Western human civilizations and Christianity, Jerusalem, Christianity, Judaism, Athens, the cradle of the, the root of Western civilization to start with, Alexandria, the library, the pinnacle of Western human civilization in antiquity, Vienna, music. So these towers have fallen. And can I actually do something to set my land in order? We all know the answer, right? self irony the ordinary, the third, is the fragmented post-war London life. From the quotes I gave you, what characterize the ordinary London life in post-war ruins? A heap of broken images, images filled with fear. Even in dust, you smell fear. How about something even more palpable? A lot more fear. The river bears no testimony of summer nights. Now, summer nights, we're talking about um, people having fun, throwing tissues and handkerchiefs and, and uh, something you do when having lots of fun, like uh, into the river. We don't see that. And what do we see in the River Thames? No signs of happiness. We see aftermath of war, of white bodies, of bones, of something very unreal. The city has gone unreal. The rivers, instead of bearing signs of happiness, sweats oil and tar, pollution from the war, and London Bridge is falling down. 
like these towers London has fallen during First World War, right? So it's post-war London in ruins, in fragments. Um, in terms of its uh, form and structure, now, as I say, I don't have the luxuries to really go into um, the poem, but um, you, you, you could try to, to um, read the poem as I'm explaining that, okay, in your own device. So in terms of form, it's episodic in what sense? Now, I've just shown you this is a very long poem. And within this wasteland poem, we've got five sections. In a way, we've got like five poems in this big poem. And you can see from the title, first, the burial of the dead, second, game of chess, okay, like you see here, the five sections. So, game of chess, um, the burial of the dead here, perhaps, and then we've got um, uh, death by uh, fire sermons, we've got uh, death by water, and then what the thunder said, right? We've got this um, five sections. All these titles, they don't seem to have a parent connection between them. So from that to form, to start with, to put it simply. But then are they really all random? Or is there any order concealed? This is also one of the features of Mona's fragmentation, of Mona's fragments. Well, in a way, they are independent. Each scene or each episode they describe its own story and own actions. But then they are interdependent in what way? When all these images are grouped together or these sections are grouped together, it gives you the, the fragmentary picture of post-war London in ruins, the wasteland of London after First World War. So it's the independent sections, but they all work together to give you this devastating wasteland, right? Again, it's second, fragments and closure. Now, openability, we've all just seen that. We cannot make sure the meaning, and then we have no, like, a plot in the, in the story. It's all open. It has no resolution, not a clear end, because if you don't know what's happening in, in the, in, in, throughout the story, how can you have a very clear, closed end? But then, strangely, in The Wasteland, the ending, and with some kind of uh, resolution in the piece. And I'm, I'm sure you know this meaning, the, the meaning of, 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 of this word much clearer than I do. Shanti, 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 in the piece. You end with peace, doesn't seem so bad, right? So fragments and closure, they coexist. Modernism is a very, in a way, a paradoxical, tensioned or tensed existence. We always have, we always have the um, opposites working together, and then you feel always torn. And this is why this is very difficult in a way. Three, layout the positioning of sentences. Now, for this, I really need to show you. Yeah. It's um, the but in section two here, right? So this could, this is where the first word of the line starts. Before the but, we have all these blanks. Why? Why can't the, why can't the speaker or why can't Elliot st start this line, this section, or simply this line here. This is really not conforming with what we expect from a traditional poem. The positioning of sentences, where does it start? Where does it end? And sometimes Ali would have one word as a paragraph and that ends the whole section. The layout is very intriguing and we saw that in Pound already, but Earlier took it further. There is length, as I say, nothing you could expect uh, from traditional poems could be see here. There's no limitation to lines, limitation to, uh, to, to how many lines constitute one, one section. So the shortest segment, or shortest episode in the poem, the death by water, that's only 10 lines. 
But the longest one, okay, the third one, consists around 100 lines. I can't really count last night, but it's around 100 lines. It's a free flow, it's a creative free um, use of lines and stances. So lines and stances, they used to be rules, but here they become the tool or something to be broken, okay? Breaking away from all the uh, genre rules that govern the genre of poetry and techniques, the emergence uh, of free verse. As I say, it doesn't conform with any poetic rules or genre restrictions, no. And the most um, clear, the clearest sign is that you see no meter structure. Now, uh, we, we, you had some lectures on romanticism and then you sure the trademark of romantic poems is the iambic pentameter da ta 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 right do we see that no if you try to read it yourself no and then there are rhymes but you do not hear anything like a sonnet rhyme shall i compare these to summer's day thou you are more grace and more temperate uh shade of darling buts of may something like that you have those kind of um regular rhymes but you do not see that so imagine a free verse translation quotation on foreign words now this is notorious when it comes to t.s Eliot, and i could give you okay from this link all the illusion allusions uh and then the um quotations that that Eliot has embedded in his poem but i just give you a very brief example here the poems the poem begins and ends with foreign quotation it begins with il medulo fabulo okay i can't speak italian but it's from dante's purgatorio remember i'm not living i'm not dead i'm a purgatorio shuttle and this is dante's purgatorio purgatorio yes these people not really alive but not actually dying this is how Eliot starts with foreign, foreign quotation. And this is how he ends Shanti. And to him, Shanti, Shanti, it's a Eastern foreign tradition, right? And then, uh, yes, towards the end, Data, Damyata, and all these um, words from your culture, he makes use of that to end the poem. So it's translation quotation from foreign languages and culture. Suppressions of scenic fires and the absence of scenic fires. As I say, poets in this period, they try, they, they have started to doubt the usefulness of words as the conveyors of meaning. So in this poem, okay, Elia resort to the frequent use of onomatopoeia, the words that resemble sounds, juk juk, juk juk. Right? So it's like words are no longer really serving me. I want to give you some sound. And from the sound, you can imagine what's happening there. So the suppression of the scenic fires and the absence of the scenic fire. From these words, from this, from these sounds, from these pictures, you try to get what I'm trying to say. Words are no longer really serving me. The eloquence of silence, yes, final inner peace. Silence. And then from the but example, the formal blanks and the empty spaces between the lines. These are the use of signs because you see nothing there, nothing's been said, but it's, a, it's the form, the meaning. In this poem, actually, maybe. Fermented form, fermented London after the war. All right, so. Um, this is how I would, or where I would end the um, prose uh, and the um, poetic section on modernist fragments. And then I'll move on to um, very quickly on drama. Now, um, about drama, it's relatively less prominent or dynamic than uh, the genre of novel and poetry in the English tradition, but uh, we still could look at Okay, one play, very briefly, that really embodies the um, modernist fermentation. Yeats, A Hawk at the Hawk's Well. 
And why? Because it is really pulling away. But then also drawing close, reusing the tradition. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the play is about, but simply look at these pictures. Now, will you expect to see something like that uh, when the curtain lifted in any British theatre in the turn of the century? No. Which kind of cultural influence is here? You see people wearing kimono, okay, moving like that, like a puppet, and their elaborate costume, and then they do actually act like dancing on the stage. Yates here is borrowing heavily from Japanese no theatre. So again, the use of foreign elements to rejuvenate, to give something new to the Irish myth. Now, the, at the Hawkswell, it's um, heavily influenced by Japanese no theatre, but the core, the content, the plot here is actually a very a famous Irish myth, the legend of the myth of Cuculin, right? So in this kind of highly stylized movement, you can't say a lot. You can't say a very complicated story. So plot becomes not very important, but the feelings, the symbols carried or conveyed by all these highly symbolic movements then mark the content. So this highly stylized, symbolic, abstract movement that tells the story. And this is not what you see in traditional English theater. And then the entire story is, is told through one act. Again, not something you see very often. All right, so um, in terms of fermentation, I think I could give you this as an example um, about uh, from the uh, modernist drama in the English tradition. Okay, so, uh, here I would end my uh, part on um, uh, modern fermentation, and then we move on to war literature, right? So before we get to the war literature, I think it would be important to uh, highlight something about the war. First is the first three-dimensional warfare the world has ever seen. So we've got fighting happening on the air, on the land. So this dimension was newly added, okay? And then this is adding a, a lot more cruelty to the war. And then death toast, death, death toast is around 40 million. It could be more, okay? That was the stat I got. And this is a very new kind of warfare. And it, come, it came with very special features that the war had never seen at that moment. Trench warfare, because we have because of all these powerful weapons, you can't actually fight on the land. So you dug up these trenches and try to fight from there. Everything's done there, trench warfare. Aircraft bombing and tanks. Yeah, the first time the world saw um, uh, fighter jets, tanks, and also chemical weapons, gas attacks. This is the first time the world saw that. And then with the horror of the war, the soldiers, they all, many of them suffered from shell shock. So it's like the big sounds, the horror messed up their nerves. So many of them become insane or mad after the war. And for war literature, like according to Ernest Hemingway, um, novel is not its representative genre, but poetry. The only true writing that came through during the war was in poetry. And the Andrew Motion, the poet, poet laureate, uh, he, he got the title in 2019, uh, 2017. He said that war poetry is a sacred national text. So notable poets during that time would be Wilfred Owen. Yeah, I try to portray them as poets. Uh, uh, Siegfried Session, this handsome young man, they all died. Uh, Isaac Rosenberg and Robert Brooke, an Oedipo novelist, will be Fort Maddox Ford, uh, Ford, Rebecca West, Ernest Hemingway. And then my approach is I'll divide them into subject matter, again, form and techniques in both novels. And then for subject matter, I would want to talk about war fragments and about the war, because this is to fit the title, but this is about what really 
those works are about, of pity, of glory, of romance, of the war. Okay, I might be quicker now because time is running out. So in terms of subject matter, war fragments. These war literature, they depicted the fragmented state of being of soldiers after the war, shell shocked or war shocked. This is a very disturbing picture. You can choose not to look at it. But these, the, the soldiers face demonstrated very clearly the psychiatric mental aftermath of the war. They're going mad. This is not a normal face, as you can see. So in terms of novel, Rebecca Rest right, wrote The Return of Soldiers. Now I'll very quickly simply um, summarize and talk about its significance. Now, this soldier, Chris, returns from war, having the memory lost or memory messed up. He could only remember what he wants to remember. And the memory of war is also lost. When he has forgotten his family members, it brings them a lot of suffering. But then the, the, the family of this mad, mad Chris comes to turn, is using this kind of like stoic philosophy saying, well, actually, um, you are not mad. You are just sane in your own way. And this is better. Why? Because if you lost memory of something that you do not want to remember, especially the war, you came off better than those who live in it, right? So this is the fragmented state of being of soldiers, but it also brings sufferings to the family. The war does no one any good. Poetry, mental class, and the emphasis here is the devastated physical and psychological mental states of soldiers after witnessing, okay, and undergoing the horrors of war. Close readings of this poem would tell us they are really devastated. They have, they have their tongues drooping. You can see from here or here, they've got the tongues drooping from the jaw. They've got barring teeth, they've lost their teeth. And then there is uh, the man who fought death, but death had in a way conquered them. They live in pain, stroke and stroke and pain, and in panic, they lived in fear and in pain. They're all messed up in terms of their memory, in terms of physical and their mental health, because they are so shocked by the horror of war. And the state of being, they are the living dead, purgatorial shadows, more hellish than the figures they see from the hell of war in twilight. They're not living nor dead, they are twilights. They're living like a twilight figure, not living nor dead, zombies purgatorial shadows, they were all very much fragmented by the war. Second, fragmenting the described order, fragmenting what is normal, what is moral, and what is sane. Uh, Fox's novel, Parade's End. Now, what happens here, and the lessons we can see from this war, or from this novel, is, is that now we have a character named Morgan. He's also a soldier. He's taking leave from the field because he wants to claim his wife back who is having an affair with a prized boxer. So if he's going to take down the boxer, he might be beaten up or beaten to death. So he instead choose to be blown into pieces on the battlefield. The rightful title of a husband to claim that back. The cause is similar to being blown to pieces on the battlefield. And in this case, war and sex, they, they have the same function. They insult what do we call normal. How could these two things be the same? Yes, but as Julian Barnes say, um, is the war, sex, they catch him in the same way. He's going to die in one of a way, either claiming back the wife, claiming the wife back, or die on the battlefield. They're the same. But is that normal? How could that be normal? Right? Second, um, fermenting normality, morality, and sanity. Now, in um, the slides on Ulysses, we, we, we see a morning scene, right? Having breakfast 
and then you see a cat very peaceful. But this is not the kind of morning that soldiers would have on the battlefield. Every day they wake up to a red morning. And while the morning is red, it's filled with blood, with fire, with burning, so the morning is red. You don't wake up to breakfast, you wake up to kill. You must kill, you must kill. Too much killing, eyes blurred, sick like the plane. It's making me sick, it's making, it's so disgusting, it's making me sick. I, I can't see, I can't bear it anymore. Normal situations, after you had a breakfast, you go, go to work. You plush shoulders with real people. But how about soldiers? Who they brush shoulders with? They brush shoulders with the dead. I stood with the dead. They were dead. They were dead. I brush shoulders with that souls. How can I not in the state of dismay? How can I not be? And guess the wind come doubt by the guns. Our human prowess, our brutality to want to fight. In a way, it's like taking over the force of nature. But is that really sane? Is that really normal? Fall in, I shouted, fall in for your pay. What? You kill to get paid? One kills to live to get paid? Is that normal? Is that moral? Is that sane? War is fragmenting the prescribed order or expectation, fragmenting normality, morality, and sanity. And then uh, when it comes to the pity of war um, novel, right, novel. Now we cannot, I cannot leave the scene without discussing this, right? Um, destruction, violence, death, shall shot character in uh, Mrs. Dalloway, uh, Septimus Warren Smith, a famous shall shot character. And this is what happens. Now, this is quite a decent gentleman there. This is what he sees during the war. Horror, horror, killing everywhere. And this really messing his mind up. After he survived, we should consider himself very lucky that he survived. Um, she survives the war. But is that really a good thing? After his return, when he's in London with the company hall of his wife, this is what his mind, state of mind is, the shell shock character. He's still seeing wars, fighting. He's still seeing blood. The world wavered and quivered and threatened to burst into flames. This is not the world of London. This is the world of the battlefield. The world shaked and moved because of those weapons, those guns, those bombings. That battlefield is burst into flames, but not London, but he's still living in the shadow. He's got mad. He starts hallucinating. He began to talk loud, answering people, arguing, laughing, crying, getting very excited, making her, the wife, the poor wife, to write things down. Hallucinating, getting really mad. Perfect nonsense, as nonsense, they're very perfect about death. He's still living in, very much living in the horror of war. And you can see she could stand that no longer. So it's the pity of war depicted in novel. And uh, Mrs. Dalloway as character, Septimus Smith really shows that. And then um, poetry, um, when depicting the um, horror of war, of pity, um, you can't escape talking about the uh, trench poems as in Rosenberg wrote this in 1916. It's a very powerful poem and we can quickly look through that. Only a lift thing lifts my hand and that's a red and that that's a red. The only thing that's alive in the trenches it's a red. When the speaker is trying to pull poppies to stick behind the year, so the red poppy flower, maybe someone died again, okay, they, they die every day. So the speaker is trying to pick some poppies to commemorate. And you can see the speaker here is still quite a human being. 
okay, can still, in a way, recognize to think about a, a rat. Draw rats, they will shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. So um, the rats seems to be coming here to show sympathy, to have to give some companionship. In the eyes of the speaker, this rat knows sympathy, while they, the enemies, they are human beings, but they seem to not be able to feel sympathy and humanity. What they know is simply to kill. They torn the earth apart, they torn France apart, to, to, the, to the point that no poppies could really grow. So if we can't grow poppies outside, can our blood be the ground that grows, that grows poppies? But the answer is no, because there's so much blood stinks in our vines. And if you try to grow poppies, the poppies would die, drop and ever dropping. So what's the best place to keep a poppy? Maybe on my ears, that's the safest place. Not in our veins, not outside on the soil. So here we could really see the contrast between a moment of peace and what is usually happening. There's no place for even a poppy on the battlefield. And I want you to draw attention to the last line uh, just a little white with the dust, white with the dust. The fragility of the red petals. Okay, so the petals are there with white with the dust. The red petals, they are very fragile and the dust are very light. And this fragile light objects is con in contrast with the immensity of war and its horror. So I think these contrasts in this um, animal-human interaction, we see very clearly the brutality of this anti-human war. So this is poetry, okay, on the pity of war. Uh, I think uh, very quickly talked about the um, horrible records of those of this horrible war. Um, it would be comprehensive to talk about some kind of poetry that shows a form of patriotic feeling. At the beginning of the war, um, Robert Brooke, he wrote a, a poem, Peace, encouraging the young man to go to war because fighting for a country, it's a form of glory. It's a form of courage and you give us hope and it's very romantic. So it is a form of glory and honor to fight for the country. And this is a solid form of love to fight for your country because God be thanked who has matched us with this hour. So it's a very timely call. And this timely call calling us to die, okay, has strengthened us has um, weakened us from sleeping with hand made sure, eyes made clear and power sharpened. This call to glory with burning adrenaline is hand, kind of like empowering us. And then we are so determined to, to go to war because this old world has grown old and cold and weary. We are there to remake it. We do not want to live in an old world with hard things with no honor. We want to go out and fight and gain glory for ourselves and also for our country. And so we swim out there, okay? Um, like, uh, so we, so we, uh, okay. So um, when they are at the uh, uh, battlefield, they feel, themselves very, very much honored um, because they no, no longer feel ashamed. We have released the shame. It's, the battlefield is not a bad place. It's no ill, no grief. It's okay. Well, something might have gone broken. Um, this body, but nothing else. Not broken, save this body. Yes, this broken. This body has got broken, but nothing else. Referring maybe to the spirit my enthusiasm to fight, my love for my country. Um, something has been lost. 
my breath has, I've lost my breath sometimes, but no, not other things. And then uh, nothing to shake the laughing heart and long peace. Even though I'm wounded, even though I might be dying, my heart is in the long peace and nothing to shake that form of happiness. The only thing that might threaten this kind of peace would be death, but death has its ending. So it's like that battlefield is not too bad and you should go and fight for this country. And when you are answering that call to glory, you are then in a very honorable position. You can go and fight and you should go and fight. You should not be afraid of death because death is our enemy, but also our friend. Now, this is the spectrum of war poetry. On the one hand, most of the poets still were writing about the horror of war, the fragmented um, normal, normality, morality. But on the other hand, there will be some call to glory, right? So this is the spectrum. And in terms of novel, um, Hemingway has something to say. During, um, uh, Second World War, he himself served as an ambulance driver, and then uh, he fought on the Italian front line. And then uh, a war novel he wrote would be uh, the famous A Farewell to Arms. And this is a romantic novel in the sense that during the toughest time of human existence, a war of such a scale, he found true love. So the war does no one any good, but there are some lights, perhaps. He has fallen deeply in love with a nurse. Patrick, the ambulance driver, has fallen in love with a nurse. And this is, this is a form of love that is rare, that is pure, that, is, that, is, that does not happen very often. We could feel alone when we were together, alone against the others, a very close, pure bond. It has only happened to me like that once. So in the toughest of situation, it brings the purest and rarest form of love. Well, romance, here you go, here you see, call to glory. So again, it's the spectrum. One, on, on the one side, the horror. On the other side, a little bit of light, of glory, of romance. And then uh, form and techniques poetry. Now, this is again a very uh, famous poem by uh, Wilfred and uh, Owen, okay, The Next Wall. And then when it comes to form and technique, I will be focusing on because I, fo I focus on fermentation, is pulling away from the genetic rules and we see the blending of registers. This poem is written in a sonnet form. Many of the war poems, actually, they were written in the sonnet form. And uh, the reason why it might be this very um, traditional Asian form of poetry could internalize this major event in history, perhaps, right? So this is a sonnet. We've got the uh, 12, of 12 plus 2, 14 lines. And then if you are thinking about sonnets, you think about Shakespearean sonnet, think about the diction. It's very graceful, very elegant, right? And then the rhyming, it's very regular. But what you see here, you see very colloquial use of language, the old chum. And the old chum, what is the subject of this old chum? Who is this old chum? Oh, in the trenches during the war, the soldiers have made friends with death and calling death the old chum, this colloquial language. And then in terms of rhyme scheme, yes, you see bland and hand, death and breath, but you do not see it here. Breath cause a loft synth, you do not see it here. So the, in terms of rhyme scheme, it's not as regular as the normal sonnet and the diction is a lot less um, formal. Graphic sensory details. Now, one thing about war, war literature is that it no longer simply um, talking about a sense of sight. Seeing, sense of sight, is like the noblest sense. Seeing, understanding, the noblest sight. But the thing is, 
during wartime. Nothing could be really sensible. Things are not making sense. So seeing, understanding human intellect, they're no longer useful. So what comes up? Survival mode, the lower senses, sense of touch, sense of taste. So these poems are rich, very rich in sensory descriptions. And then with the lower sense, set down and eat with death eat, sense of taste, we sniffed sense of smell, the lower, say, the lower senses, they come to the foreground. This is not what you see in all the poems. So, um, and I will skip the two and then just simply jump to the um, use of dashes. Now, we know from the previous um, slides, uh, modern fermentation celebrates pauses and silence, the the eloquence of silence. And then we see it here again, dashes, semicolon, pauses, suspension of meaning, but filled with emotion. So the silence and pauses, they are seen a lot. The use of dashes, silence as modernist fragments. And also um, in terms of techniques, we also want to see the fragmentary presence of the old. Another representative um, poem by Wilfred Owen, uh, Deuce at Decorum. Now, I want to simply focus on this phrase. You know, from the, the look of it, it's not English, it's actually Latin. And it's from a word, from a work uh, of the Roman poet Horace translates as, it is sweet and fitting to die for the homeland. So the use of the old, the presence of the old. This is glorifying the war, but in the present context, is this line glorifying the war still holds truth? No. According to the poet, this is sweet and fitting to die for the homeland. It's an old lie. Why? Because it's no longer glorious. It's gruesome. We have chemical attacks along the trenches. Gas, gas, quick boys. Those poisonous gas, they form the thick green light. And then soldiers drown in it. We fight with no boots. We fight having blood on our bodies all around. We've gone blind, drunk with fatigue. If you are attacked by those chemical gases, this is what happens to you. Your eyes turn white, you cough, your lungs out. The sores are incurable. You cannot move your tongue anymore. This is what happens on, on the battlefield. And do you still keep this sentiment? It's fitting and sweet to die for your country. Do you you keep that sentiment. Is this what you want to tell the young boys who are desperate for glory? So it's the questioning of the old beliefs and ideas, the fragmentary presence of the old. Okay, so uh, those very brief notes on modernism, uh, on, on war literature, and it's time to tie them together. One is some World War I and fragmentation and fragments. How do they connect? Now, um, First World War did a, had lots of heavy impacts, and one of the most important impacts was that it reshuffled the power balance of the entire world. The fall of the old tradition, the old European domination of the world, it fell after such a war. And what? who came to power? The Americans. So this is like the reshuffling of the cards, the re reshuffling of world order. And then shuffling is the only thing that nature cannot undo. What has happened has happened. Deal with it, take it, deal with it. And how do writers, artists, they deal with it? Faced with such profound disillusionment of the, the brutality of war, and how could we do anything like that? And how could we destroy our people, our land? How could we, at, at the first place, produce something that's horrible, the chemical gas the tanks? So it's profound sense of this, this disillusionment and the wasteland of London, the destruction of the civilization centers. All right, so how to deal with it? How to channel this kind of desperation? 
Mm. So they had what we call modernism, a fragmented world bred a form of fragmented language, uh, language fragmented literary um, mode of representation, and that's modernism. All right, so my concluding fragments would be uh, from again Vincent Cherry. Um, he said, literary modernism is a cultural or literary movement that is like a sponge absorbing the volatile forces of modernity, of what happened at the turn of the century. As of challenges, crisis, uh, changes, challenges, and crisis. More passively, literary modernism or literary fragments or fragmented modernism. Uh, witnesses and, re and um, being the records of what's happened, but also with the echoes and answers that try to say something, do something about the fermented world that's more um, active. Okay, so these are so literary modernism or fermented modernism um, is doing all these four actions to the crisis and changes and the challenges between or to the old and the new. And this is well, how do we define modernist fragments, writing the fragments and writing fragmentarily as a way to look at early modernism. Okay, and here I would end my lecture and thank you very much for your patience and participation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ivan, for uh, discussing at length, uh, you know, about the fragments, about the features of the age, discussing in de details about the fragmentation, uh, what people really mean, what we should undermine, uh, the meaning, the, you can say, uh, the understanding of the age has been very well put forward. I hope those who have missed today, I'm sure have missed a very, very insightful lecture on a very, very pertinent phase of life, a phase of history of English literature. Uh, the way you dealt in details about, uh, uh, you know, Kurds, uh, it's, you know, the way you dealt in details about wasteland, uh, you talked in details about the concept of fragmentation, starting right from uh, modernism, traits of modernism, uh, and 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 giving exquisite examples throughout uh, was something that I really appreciated, and it was really a very insightful lecture. I'm sure we thoroughly enjoyed. The participants have enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. And uh, you can see in the chat box, I think, the participants are appreciative of the lecture, which was very insightful, which you delivered today. And thank you for uh, spending so much of time with us today. So we really feel very honored and happy. And I must say that uh, this has been one of the most insightful lecture of this series so far. And because we are going into this particular very important phase of uh, uh, modernism and wars, you know, literature. It was, I, I think this is, uh, this is completely the befitting beginning lecture of this modern and postmodern series that we are starting from today. Because right from today in the next three, four uh, lectures uh, is what we should be very careful. And we have various kinds of examinations here for assistant and associate professors. Uh, this lecture, uh, this this particular five days, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14th, and 15th, uh, are the majority from which questions are asked. So I'm sure, I'm sure, and the way you have dealt it, it was very insightful, very clearly, uh, you know, that the concepts were very clearly put across. And uh, you can see the chat box, there are, you know, the testimony to the fact that we really enjoyed, you can see the appreciation messages. And at the same time, there are a few questions. If you permit, we can have those. If you feel like we can, you can try to answer. I think I will, I will leave that important task to, to you because my mind right. now is a bit fragmented. <laughs> right. <laughs> the first question is by Fatima Saifi. And uh, Fatima Sefi says that Virginia Woolf uh, clearly had an influence of James Joyce. Uh -huh. 
and uh, yeah. virginia wolf had some you know she had uh, some accepted features of james joyce's in her novels so she is mm. just curious to know the similarity in the works of virginia wolf and james joyce well wow. now this is a very important question and this should be like is i really appreciate that and this will take another lecture to answer actually but um on on the spot i would say these two um writers they found uh the modern well i shouldn't say that they perfected the method of stream of consciousness interior monologue as the technique of free direct speech as the shifting in and out of the narrator between the narrator's mind and also what's happening in the world this kind of shifting has been perfected by these two great modernists so uh this is would be one of the um the shared commonality between them and the other as you can see from Ulysses and Mrs Dalloway they focus on the ordinary the ordinary right. mundane life as I as I said we don't see dukes and nobles fighting we don't see knights fighting for the pope no it's breakfast it's Dalloway preparing a party for the posh people in London and they dealt with the war as well so I think in terms of subject matter in terms of their literary um use of literary techniques i think they are the uh, very similar and very comparable in these two um aspects but uh, if we want to talk about similarity uh, difference differences i think one is that i think wolf doesn't want to keep the critics very busy by using lots of illusions so this would be uh, one of the obvious similarity uh the, the difference and then here i would kind of take liberty of promoting one author to, to my audience um, is the author Dorothy, Dorothy Richardson. Uh, it's not because I, I wrote my, my thesis on, on her, but she was actually the first writer who invented stream of consciousness. She herself disliked the label. She rejected that. But she was the first writer in the entire history of English literature to start putting human psyche at the center stage of literary representation. So she was the first one. Wolf wrote on her saying the method still sought to name. And then it's the um, sentence of feminine psych psychology. So Richardson was the first person, I'm speaking like a supporter, but she was that kind of figure. And then uh, she found that method and was then perfected by Joyce and Wolf and stream of consciousness became the trademark of these two big names. So that returned to my first answer and hopefully that answered the question. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, now there's, this, there's one more uh, question which is not directly related. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's opinion, opinion question. It's up to you whether you'd like to answer or not. This is by Hans Smitha and she says that uh, we know that many artists drew inspiration from non-Western culture during this period. Mm. Mm, now, mm. Do, do we find some examples of fragmentation in non-Western literature in English? Non non-english you mean written not in in in, in english non-western oh. literature in english no uh, she means i think uh, uh literature which is written in english but not from the western world ah well i think there are many when you think about thomas mann right when i think of Tom thomas mann when you think about kafka right right and then uh yeah, I think that would be the two big, big names that just that could just popped up. It's right. uh, the, the cultural background, the Kafka and Thomas Mann, they are not from England, right? They belong to the continent. Uh, they mm -hmm. have fragmentations like Kafka's, uh, the Beatle, his world has been fragmented. Right? So, yeah. yeah, in so many ways. And Thomas Mann, um, that's in Venice, the drowning lives fragmented. So I think these two are the big figures that could come up, just pop up to my mind. Not very helpful. <laughs> sure, it is. Uh, next by Tariq Ali, there's a question and it's an hypothetical question. So 
Tarik asks that hypothetically, how would a romantic poet react to the horrors of World War? I mean, how would their poem reflect such events? Yeah. Wow, that's a big one. Um, I would say that they would be most devastated by the form of uh, or the extent of alienation that the war brought to the world. Because when you think about the romantics, it's all about connections, connection with nature, right? Connection with people. So it's, I think they would react very strongly to the form of alienation caused or brought by the war. And then um, in a way, I, 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 that might have really paralyzed them. So if they were to write, I'm not sure if they were write in fermentation, but I think would be some very direct outbursts of paralysis of hopelessness, of desperation, because we know the romantics, they do not like holding back. They want to say something simply like that. And they go on and on and on about that. So they might feel paralyzed, but they will, um, um, they, some of them will simply stop writing, but some of them will try to channel the form of lamination with very, very long, long, long poems. It might not be in fragmentation, but um, in their own way, they would express uh, their forms of alienation that they would feel most devastated by. And then my, I, my guess would be, they will be producing something much longer than the wasteland. Right. You're right, <laughs> uh, hypothetical, because I can't say I know the romantics very well, but this is just my two cents. <laughs> I'm well put, put across. <laughs> we take the last <laughs> question of the day. This is by Agnimitra Roy. And uh, Agnimitra's question is, we mostly read modernism from the angles of literature, art, and film. Mm. How did modernism impact music? If I wish to touch upon that aspect for students in brief, how would I approach it? Um, very good question indeed, because modernism, it's a uh, movement that moves across all the arts form. And then the musical representation of modernism will be Schomburg's atonal music. So we all know every music is written with a tone, with, with, with a scale. So, um, you've got a key, right? But then for um, a tonal music, you do not have a key. So it's written in like uh, in G major or E minor, no. There has no tone. Fermenting the rules, the key that governs every uh, musical composition would be you've got, okay, this is written in E major. So you've got the flat and sharps according to E major. But a tonal is that we do not have this rule anymore. Just write what you want. We've got no rules. We've got key is no longer the, the, the rule. So it's a tonal music by Schoenberg. This is a very good introduction to an understanding um, how fermented the world has become. Even songs come without a key, a tonal. So this is a very way good way in to understanding modernism as well. Thank you for a very good question. Well, uh, with that, we come to the conclusion of a very enriching and insightful session. I'm sure we all have enjoyed it. And thank you uh, from, you know, from the bottom of our heart for the, the preparation for the time that you have lent uh, in preparing this lecture. I'm sure it is very reflective of the fact that you have spent a lot of time preparing this lecture and we were in touch for a long time. Uh, thank you on behalf of Team Dad Voyage. It was an absolute honor and pleasure to have you because it is, as I discussed uh, prior to the lecture, it is only because of the support and resource person uh, and enthusiastic and knowledge sharing kind of resource person like y'all 
that we have been able to con you know continue this endeavor academic endeavor in spite of so many barriers for around two and a half years so on behalf of our general uh, dad voyage and on behalf of all the participants and the team members of our general i extend my regards to you thank you so much please take care and hopefully we will again hope hope to have you see you soon on this uh, platform in the near future thank you very much please take care lots of love from india thank you thank you bye sorry enjoyed it good night thank you bye. good night bye